session, I will be looking at resisting the sick role through self-portraits. I will introduce the concept of the sick role and discuss a few artists who I believe resist this role through works that center images of themselves. And this will lead into a discussion of my own art practice and my concept of the assisted self-portrait and the various forms this takes. I am a member of Resting Up, an interdisciplinary group of chronically ill and disabled friends practicing slowness and crip time to create, think and interrupt neoliberal pressures and expectations on the body. To give a content warning, through the entire session, I'm going to be talking about traumatic events related to illness, medical gaslighting and sexual violence. There will also be flashing images in some of the films that I'm going to show in the later part of the session. I'll give another warning before any footage which contains flashing images which could trigger those with visual sensitivity or photosensitive epilepsy. If you're not feeling up to this particular kind of content this evening, there's no judgment. And if anyone would like to leave, that's fine. So, what am I referring to when I say the sick role? The sick role is the idea that sickness is a temporary deviation that comes with certain expectations and societal obligations. It was conceptualized by Talgett Parsons, who, unfortunately for us, was one of the most influential American sociologists of the 20th century. He outlined the sick role in a section of his 1951 book, The Social System, a conservative text which claims to analyze a variety of social systems, including modern medical practice. Parsons believed that we are all indebted to society. Throughout childhood, he believed we rack up a sizable debt, and as adults, we must pay back this debt by working, earning, and being contributing members of society. If we become ill, we enter what he termed the sick role, which, whilst being a deviation, entitles us to some concessions, such as a break in our work, our studies, or what he terms normal activity. However, in return, the sick person must submit entirely to the doctor in order to get better, which must be the only goal for the sick person. The sick role then requires a bodily surrender to medicine's objectifying gaze. The sick person then is considered by Parsons a sort of deviant, and the physician, who he endows with pristine rationality, is the vital agent of social control entrusted with authority over the sick subject. So already, it's starkly obvious the many issues with the system. It does not take into account chronic illness. It does not take into account health discrimination. It does not take into account the lack of access to healthcare for many, particularly in countries where they don't have healthcare, which is free at the point of access, but even partly in countries where they do. It does not take into account where medicine fails us, and it assumes medicine and the doctor are all knowing. Although Parsons' writings aren't as popular in medical schools today, or in academia generally, his writings on the role of the doctor and the sick person or patient are clearly still present in both medical and popular culture. Frank and the Restitution Narrative in his book, The Wounded Storyteller, academic Arthur W. Frank outlined various narratives stories of sickness often fall into, based on his extensive interviews with other sick people. The most commonly seen in pop culture, he believed, was the restitution narrative, which is rooted in the patient's drive to get better and overcome illness, and always centers the physician and privileges their heroism or their so-called heroism. Frank sees the restitution narrative as a legacy of Parsons' sick role, which he views as a grand narrative in which these restitution narratives sprout from. He explains that, and this is a quote, one of the most important aspects of the physician's performance, according to Parsons, is refusing to collude with the patient, end of quote. Therefore, the patient 
must be viewed at a distance by the physician. They are not viewed as reliable witnesses to their own illness and their input cannot be trusted. For Parsons, this is because although the sick are not entirely responsible for their sickness, there is, according to him, motivated behaviour that leads them towards sickness. Additionally, as opposed to the rational objectivity of the physician, the sick person for Parsons embodies, and this is another quote, a combination of helplessness, lack of technical competence and emotional disturbance. End of quote. The chronically ill, mad, crip, disabled, then have no place in Parsons' model for a well-functioning society. We are placed outside of society. We are the leaky valve, the broken pipe, the puncture in society's wheels, letting all the hard work of good, healthy, contributing workers go to waste. This model, then, is, in my opinion, dehumanizing, infantilizing, objectifying, and reeks of eugenics. Modern patienthood. Frank conceptualizes the experience of modern patienthood in light of the sick role. He views the sick role not only as a literal bodily surrender of the sick person's self over to medicine, but additionally as a narrative surrender, asserting that the physician becomes the spokesperson for disease. Significantly, this narrative yielding for Frank results in a colonization of the sick person's experience in which their voice, particular story and identity is elided or erased. As he writes that, and this is another quote, individual suffering is reduced to medicine's general view, end of quote. Thus, the experience of modern patienthood for Frank is mediated through the language, narrative structures, and knowledge legitimated by biomedicine. A profession that has historically been, and continues to be, dominated by white, heteronormative, financially privileged, non-disabled cis men. Consequently then, representational bias takes place when the story told by the physician becomes the one against which others are ultimately judged true or false, useful or not. As such, modern Western biomedicine for Frank began when physicians asserted their authority as scientists by imposing specialised language on their patients' experiences. Put simply, modern Western biomedicine inherently treats the sick person like an object to be fixed. It dictates the language and narratives of experience onto the sick rather than being led by their or our experiences. When we experience bodily and narrative surrender, there is a threat to our subjectivity, to who we are and to who we think we are. This sort of threat can be extremely traumatizing. And for me, this is why this experience of not being believed or not having space for our narrative in modern medicine is so damaging. Resisting this role and this model. So now that we have a basic understanding of the sick role and its potential effects on those of us who don't get better, I will discuss some of the artists who I believe resist this role followed by a discussion of how I try to resist this role in my own art practice. Representing the self. So why self-portraits? Writing the self, drawing the self, filming the self, photographing the self. These are all explorations of subjectivity. These are all ways of exploring and representing our selfhood. So I believe representations of self can help counteract this damage done to our subjectivities by modern patienthood, by medical gaslighting, by narrative colonization. The first two artists I want to mention are chronologically before Parsons and the sick role, but they're important when considering this lineage of art because of how they explore subjectivity through visual self-representations and resist the
Seven. She's considered a feminist icon, a queer icon, a disability icon, and a socialist icon, as she was an active member of the Mexican Communist Party. Carlo had polio when she was six, which caused her right leg to have chronic pain and be thinner. When she was 18, she was in a very bad and traumatic bus crash, in which several people died. She was essentially impaled on a pole. Her pelvis was fractured and her abdomen and uterus predominantly on her spine. She was often in a corset-like cast which covered her entire abdomen. When she was 46, a year before she died, her right leg was amputated due to gangrene. She died in 1954. The official cause of death was a pulmonary embolism but they didn't perform an autopsy and her cause of death was disputed. A nurse who cared for her claimed she had taken an overdose because she was in too much pain. She is probably one of the most famous self-portrait artists. It could be said that she painted herself so frequently for practical reasons and she was often confined to her bed. And it was from her bed after the bus crash she began painting. She said, I paint myself because I am so often alone and because I am the subject I know best. There are photos of her painting in her bed, which is a wooden four poster, and there is a mirror on the top panel. So as she lays down, she sees herself above. Her image is so ubiquitous. Now you can buy a representation of her face on almost anything. Ironically, and frankly, offensively, considering what she stood for, even Theresa May has been spotted wearing a bracelet with her face on it. Although Carlo was painting in Mexico and before Parsons' influence in Western biomedicine, when discussing subjectivity, illness and the self-portrait, she has to be mentioned. So much of her work explores the self and utilises her own distinctive image to explore and represent pain. Her painting, The Broken Column, depicts her naked, standing outside. The ground behind her is full of cracks. She has a bedsheet around her lower half. The middle of her body is open to reveal a Greek-style column where her spine would be. The column is covered in cracks, but holds together. Her torso is wrapped in a bandage like corset. Her body and face are covered in nails. Her hair hangs down and there are tears coming from her eyes. She has one prominent eyebrow and visible hair above her lip. But her face is expressionless. I think from this painting it's clear that she wasn't just painting herself for practical reasons. There is a clear depiction of pain but also I see power in it. Her spine is replaced with this grand structure of classical architecture. The world behind her is broken, but she stares directly at us. To me, it feels like both an expression of grief and a reclamation of power. It feels like she's saying, yes, I am in agony, and yes, my spine is crumbling, but I am important and I will make myself, as I am, seen. Leonora Carrington. Again, I'm sure many of you know who she is, but for those who don't, she was an artist and writer born in England in 1917 to an upper-class family, but spent much of her adult life in Mexico, becoming naturalised and eventually staying and settling there from the 1960s, and living there until 2011 when she died at the age of 94. As such, by many she is considered a British-Mexican artist. Her father was a textiles tycoon. They lived in a gothic mansion in Lancashire for the first 10 years of her life, although all of her school years were spent at various boarding schools as each one gave up on her. The aesthetic of this mansion of her early childhood, however, is often seen throughout her work. 
providing a set of trauma and confinement. Her father didn't agree with her being an artist, but her mother encouraged her. She studied at the Chelsea School of Art in London in 1935 when she was 18. The following year, she transferred to an art school in France, which is where she met surrealist artist Max Ernst in 1937. She was 19, he was 46 and married. They began a relationship and moved in together. In these pre-World War II years, she was living and breathing the French surrealist movement. Although Carrington painted many self-portraits and wrote many short stories that speak to her childhood and her resistance to the role of upper-class debutante, I would like to focus on one particular time in her life, likely the most traumatic, and two pieces of work that directly speak to that time. Her short memoir-style text down below and a painting of the same name. In 1939, during the Second World War, Ernst was arrested as a degenerate artist and eventually imprisoned. Carrington tried unsuccessfully to free him and eventually, after her friend persuaded her, they left France for Spain. She later reflects that she was in a catatonic state because of the war and what happened to Ernst. The memoir is written three years after the events and details this experience. She had bulimia at this time as she associated the war, the sickness of the world and what was happening around her with her stomach and thought she needed to cleanse the world and had power over the things that were happening. With her friend, they made it to Madrid where she was raped by a group of Spanish soldiers. Eventually, she was hospitalised for being mad, as she puts it, and then interned at a sanatorium on her father's orders in which she was given injections of a medicine which induced epileptic fits and was said to cure madness. Eventually, she became lucid enough, or perhaps compliant enough, to be transferred. Her childhood nanny was sent to chaperone her, and she escaped during this process. Eventually, marrying, having sons, and living out her life as an artist in Mexico. In 1941, in the midst of this experience, she painted a piece called Down Below. Down below was the name for the part of the sanatorium patients were moved to when they were allowed more freedoms. I can't show the painting as it's still in copyright, but I've shared a link to it. The painting shows a self-portrait of Carrington. She is standing outside in the dark to the right, encased in something. Some suggest she's encased in a butterfly or transforming into a butterfly. There is a horse next to her. Horses were an image that she identified with throughout her life and often painted as sort of self-portraits. There are four surreal figures lying on the ground to her left, naked, part animal, part women, some with masks on. In the background, there is something that looks like a circus tent and something which looks like a manor or castle, perhaps representative of the house from her childhood. This is the only painting that survived from this moment in her life. It is not, in my opinion, a painting of power, like Carlo's, but rather a dark, hard to define or understand painting. It's been suggested all the figures are self-portraits, but what I take from it is a compulsion to try to find herself and understand herself amidst chaos through painting the self and at points through writing the self. Experiences of prolonged illness and of trauma cause a kind of chaos. And within this chaos, I believe, the artists I'm talking about use painting and self-representation to try to make sense of it and to try to reclaim their power and narratives. Joe Spence. Joe Spence was a British photographer, writer and phototherapist. Born in 1934 in London and living until 1992. Phototherapy is a way of using photography for healing purposes. Spence utilised phototherapy in her art practice in order to understand her experience of illness, breast cancer and being a patient under Western biomedicine. She wrote, Through phototherapy, I was able to explore how I felt about my powerlessness as a patient, my relationship to doctors and nurses, my infantilization whilst being managed and processed within state institutions. 
Whilst in hospital for breast cancer, Spence recounts a doctor with a group of students appearing at her bedside. She writes, As he referred to his notes, without introduction, he bent over and began to ink a cross onto the area of flesh above my left breast. The doctor, then, treats her as an object. In choosing to read the notes other doctors have written about her, in not introducing himself or the students that observe her, in choosing to touch and mark her body without consent or explanation. Spence also writes that there are no departments of whole body medicine in any hospital I have ever attended. The concept is quite alien at any institutional level. Spence puts her finger on one of the objectifying models of medicine. The process in which the person is literally cut up by the boundaries of medical departments. Each area of the body becoming a distinct medical specialism, enacting a metaphoric dismantling of the human. The physician treating Spence for breast cancer was chiefly concerned with the part of the body that the tumour resided in. So much so that he felt enough ownership over that area of the body to mark it without considering the person he was touching. The objectifications that Spence experienced are not only normalised as standard practice, but are central to the experience of being a patient in modern times. Spence's entire photo essay on her experience of patienthood is fascinating, but I want to focus on one self-portrait she created. I have shared a link to it, but here is my representation. Spence had opted to have a lumpectomy instead of a mastectomy, defying her doctor's recommendations. For this surgery, she created a self-portrait as a talisman to take with her, to remind herself that she had some rights over her body. The image mimics the actions of the doctor, who had previously objectified and violated her by writing on her body. However, where he had drawn an X without consent, she has now written, Property of Joe Spence? Question mark. An act which attempts to reclaim her body from the doctor's objectification. With this said, the question mark, however, signals Spence's doubt in retaining full ownership over her body in that medical space. Yet, I still see a reclamation of power in this self portrait and talisman in which she defies the sick role. Pantaha Aborashi is a living multimedia artist based in LA. If you haven't heard of her, check out her website and work. Her work is extremely powerful and often incorporates representations of the self. I wanted to briefly mention her audiovisual performance art piece, Not Better Yet. It is a non-linear, chaotic, abstract and disorientating film which heavily incorporates audiovisual montage set in a medical space in which Pantaha is a patient and is seen distorting her body in a painful-looking sort of dance. She asserts in the artist's statement for Not Better Yet that my abstracted imaging of my body is heavily influenced by being so regularly in the hospital as I am constantly experiencing a very unique form of objectification in which my body is truly treated as a pound of flesh, the vitals that it produces and the malfunctions it abounds in. A notion powerfully illustrated towards the end of the film when Abareshi self-discharges against medical advice and is referred to as patient MRN4187871. Effacing her identity by reducing her to a medical number. However, she resists designation as a passive objectified patient by removing the visual signifiers of medicine, her oxygen and a surgical mask at the end of the film. Also towards the end of the film, the words I'm not better yet appear, before yet is struck through and disappears. By rejecting the word yet, Abareshi rejects the sick role, placing the yet of the restitution narrative defiantly under erasure and reclaiming chronic illness as a valid state of existence. Johanna Hedver Johanna Hedver is also a living artist. They are a Korean-American writer, artist, musician, an astrologer, who were, in their words, raised in LA by a family of witches and now live in LA and Berlin. I imagine many of you are familiar with their written manifesto-like work, Sick Woman Theory. 
If not, it is included in the links I have shared. It is vitally important to what I am talking about because it addresses the trauma of not being seen. This trauma of not being seen is something that I feel links all the artists I am speaking about. In Hedford's words, sick woman theory is an insistence that most modes of political protest are internalised, live, embodied, suffering and no doubt invisible. Sick woman theory redefines existence in a body as something that is primarily and always vulnerable. When they use the term sick woman, they are referring to anyone who is marginalised. They conclude by stating that the most anti-capitalist thing you can do is care for yourself and care for another and bear witness to each other's pain and trauma. So like the previous pieces mentioned, it is about seeing yourself and seeing one another. The piece of Hedvers I wanted to briefly discuss is a performance art piece called Sick Witch. Sick Witch is, in their words, a performance of sick woman theory. I can't show the performance here, but you can see it in full in one of the links. Here are my representations of the performance. In The Sick Witch, Hedva embodies sick woman theory, in which they, in their words, wretch, scream, need to sit down, wobble, regurgitate bullshit people have told them to do, take off many wigs, and are racked by ghosts. If you are able to, watch it and bear witness to their trauma. Assisted self-portraits. So hopefully, the artists that I've spoken about, although very briefly, have given a little bit of context to my own art practice, as these are some of the artists I feel connected to. This then leads me to discuss my own art practice, and in particular, my form of the assisted self-portrait. I group my multi-form creative practice under the title Sick of Being Patient on a website of the same name, which aims to explore experiences of illness and trauma whilst aiming to resist and challenge the expectation that the sick be patient or passive to medical paternalism. I utilise photography, collage, digital and material forms in my work, attempting to blur the lines between the creative and academic. Collaboration with other artists is central to my practice, particularly collaboration with Oscar Winter, who is my partner in art and life. We developed this concept of the assisted self-portrait together. We are interdependent. There are elements of physical, emotional and personal care in our relationship. Art and creative expression are how we survive. The lines between physical care, intimacy and artistic collaboration often collide. We began assisting each other to take self-portraits as part of our, of our practice, drawing attention to the interdependence and care we rely on from each other. The assisted self-portrait is the vision, idea or concept of individual being photographed, brought, brought into being by the assistance of another. There is an act of care and collaboration that goes into this way of working, that is directly influenced by Hedva's sick woman theory. I have used this technique in three distinct ways thus far. The first is by creating an image together in the moment. I direct Oscar or he directs me to create the self-portrait we want to produce. Another is with Oscar's permission, I recontextualize photos he has taken of me into collages. And the final way we have used this process is through audio-visual collaboration. The assisted self-portrait acknowledges that we are vulnerable alike to sick woman theory. It honours mutual care and interdependence, whilst also resisting silencing and resisting narrative colonisation, as it allows us to think about how we want to be represented and express this to someone else. To end, there will be two short audio-visual collaborative pieces made by Oscar, Winter and I demonstrating assisted self-portrait. These contain flashing images and could trigger photosensitive epilepsy.
Um, so, <laughs> okay, so I feel like that was a lot um, in quite a short space of time. Uh, so if anyone has any questions now, you can pop them in the chat um, or just like any thoughts or want to add anything. Um, it will be going onto YouTube if you want to watch it again. Um, oh, I'm seeing some really nice messages. Uh, yeah, so if you have any questions, I'll like give it a couple minutes. Um, and thank you for coming as well. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll give it like a couple minutes. Um, but also I wanted to mention some, I'll just talk for like a little bit while we see if any questions come up. So the last two films, um, I kind of like tapped them on the end without giving much context. But the one, the last one you just watched, a lot of the footage from that was on, made on a, um, uh, what are those cameras called? GoPro that was on my wheelchair. Um, and the language in it, that like, I do nothing. I require physical and assistance and prompting. The, this kind of language, anyone who's ever applied for PIT or been accepted to apply for PIT, personal independence payment, which is for those of you who don't know, um, a payment that people with uh, disabilities get to like help us live um, and yeah you have to use that like really specific language to to be accepted even if you have the same kind of condition or the same symptoms as someone else so that's what that was about um, and yeah there's no questions so I'm thinking that we can probably hang on oh maybe there's one question Okay, Emma has a question. She says, I wanted to ask how you feel your own chronic illness and sickness has changed your relationship with art, not only as a practitioner yourself, but as a viewer and consumer of art. Um, so in some ways it's changed a lot. Um, I've become very into um, seeking out other artists with illness and disability. So in, the way, in terms of making art, it's become something that I have to do. So if I go for like a period of time where I don't make something, I start to really suffer like emotionally and mentally, like it is a form that I need. And which is something that I was trying to get out with the film that I think because people who are marginalized in all different types of ways um, and are not seen in society, you're kind of chipped away at. So for me, art is one way in which I can kind of like build myself back up and make myself seen and 
remind myself who I am and that I exist. And then in terms of consuming, I like to consume art that teaches me about other people's experiences, but also that kind of reflects my own back to me, which might be kind of narcissistic, but it's more like to find a community. So a lot of the people here are the friends who make art, who are sick and disabled and who have the same experiences. So I kind of try to, or have a need to like consume art that is, that is also reflecting those experiences and, and the differences within those experiences. Cause it's like huge, you know, we don't all have the same experience. Um, I'm just seeing if there's any more questions. Sorry, I can't bend my neck. That's why my head is like right at the thing. No, oh, okay, sorry, I'm just reading the nice messages. Um, okay, someone's asked Kate, hi Kate. Someone she's asked, could you say something about your process of gathering footage? Um, so the footage was a mixture of stuff. It was a mixture of um, really quickly drawn, very scratchy illustrations by me and a lot of stock footage. There's a website called Pexels, which I'm gonna put in the chat. Um, and on there you can get loads of free stock footage. So if you're making films or collages, sorry, I'm just trying to find a way. Okay, I'm just gonna say it out loud because I can't figure out how to, Okay, share to everyone, sorry, Pexel. So yeah, there's loads of free stock footage on there. Obviously you can also pay for stock footage off other places, but there's heaps on there. And even though you're using the same footage as other people, you can change it so much when you're editing it that it looks completely different. So it's a mixture of stock footage, um, a mixture of uh, images that are in the public domain. So I get those off of, if you said, public domain loads of places come up but a lot of art galleries put their like artworks which are over 100 years old they're in the public domain they put online um the welcome collection does nasa does which is where i get a lot of the um uh, space kind of images from um and then also it's stuff that we've collected so actually quite a few of the images from hospital were me in hospital um, normally I'd made it so you couldn't actually see my face in most of them, or it was Oscar having filmed like my drip or having filmed something. So it was a real mixture. We just like collect things. Uh, there's another question. Sorry, there's fireworks in the background. Um, given the variety of mediums you work within, do you have a type of art you go to as a starting point? Very interested in your process of I did final form. So, the reason that I work in so many mediums is actually kind of because of my illness, because if I had the physical capacity, I would probably sculpt and paint all day. Those are the things that I absolutely love to do, but I can't really stand up or live long enough to do those. So that's why I do so much digital work. I have a, a stand, an iPad stand that literally holds my iPad above my head so I can be flat and I can do digital collages, digital drawings. So it's not that I have necessarily a process that's led by my creative um, inclinations. It's more led by what I'm physically able to do on that day. Um, so I will try and do, try and paint or sculpt. Um, but most of the time, digital is just so much more accessible to me. Um, and in terms of, I don't really, I just kind of start working on stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so if you just said like Frida Kahlo. So one of the links that I sent um, at the beginning is to a um, article about Frida Kahlo and it shows her painting in bed when she was after her bus accident and then kind of throughout her entire life. And it's just amazing watching how she worked. And I did try to paint in bed for a while and I still do sometimes. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of, I. I generally work in the, in the format or medium that is accessible to me at that point, or like when ideas come to me, I'll do them digitally first. And then maybe if I have capacity, do them kind of in a different um, medium after that. Uh, there's another question. Do you have a current project that you're working on that you're happy to discuss? Um, so I'm a member of Resting Up Collective, uh, which, is putting this on with the remote body. Um, and I'm a member of a group of 
uh, three people, two of my good friends, a group called Triad, and we're working on some things. I don't know if I'm allowed to say anything about that yet. Um, and then personally, I don't know, I've been working on this film. <laughs> um, I've always got loads of little things going on. Um, I'm writing a, a memoir, like an illness art memoir. Um, and I've got like a sort of memoir piece coming out soon um, on uh, Life Continues After, uh, which is a friend's website. Uh, yeah, it's just like lots of little, little things going on. Um, okay, cool. So it is, it's so strange not having any faces here, but I'm talking to myself. It's 10 to, and I'm guessing people might be tired or, hi. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna wrap up unless anyone puts any other questions in. Um, yeah, so thank you so much everyone for coming. It's nice to see your faces. Um, and yeah, come. Oh, some, someone's written something else. Oh, sorry, you're just getting my face as well. I read nice comments. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Um, it's going to be on YouTube. So if it was too fast, you can go and have a look at it at another point. And big love to everyone. I hope you all have a restful night. And check out the Remote Body Instagram for all the other events that they're doing and yeah thanks for coming bye thank you